Calling the 7 o'clock, February 18th, 2014, Sherwood City Council to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Mayor Middleton. Here. Council President Henderson. Here. Councilor Grant. Here. Councilor Folsom is absent. Councilor Butterfield. Here. Councilor Langer. Here. Councilor Clark. Here. Thank you. Okay, before we approve the consent agenda, we're going to pull resolution 2014-009, authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with General Pacific Inc. to supply an advanced metering infrastructure system down to new business so with that would still we will approve the february 4th minutes resolution 2014 adopting budget uh, officer for fiscal year 2014 15 resolution 2014 authorizing city manager to sign the 2014 iga with portland police bureau for purposes of participation in the regional justice information network and resolution 2014-010 authorizing the uh, Marjorie Stewart Senior Center name to change to the Marjorie Stewart Center. I move consent as amended. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Our next is presentations, and that's the TSP update by our city engineer, Bob Galati. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Tonight we're going to be presenting to you our status update of uh, the TSP update that we're doing for the uh, for our transportation system plan. Uh, our consultant, DKS, uh, uh, is our transportation enge uh, engineering firm, consulting. And uh, Chris Majeski will be presenting to you um, the TSP update, our status update, and where, where we're going with things right now. So with that, I'm going to leave that up to Chris. All right. Thanks, Bob. Again, I'm, I'm Chris Majeski with DKS Associates. And what we wanted to do tonight was give you a, a brief overview of, of what is a transportation system plan, high level, so you know what we're, we're talking about, and then tell you a little bit about our process and where we're at in that process and see if there's questions that you might have. Um, so what is a transportation system plan or a TSP update? Um, some of the key elements that we're really looking for is going out 20 years in the future. This is a master plan. Looking at the public facilities, not, not private driveways or, or alleys or anything like that, but the public roadways and making sure we can accommodate 20 years of growth. That's what this plan is all about, making sure we protect the community and, and help it grow. As we do that, we come up with improvement projects and we try to match those with the city's goals, have those, those things aligned. And one of the most challenging pieces is we really have to balance all the different modes of how people travel in into Sherwood, walking, biking, transit, driving. How do we balance all those so it's equitable for all types of users? And how do we make an efficient transportation system? How do we balance revenue streams with the expenditures that we're going to have to make those improvements? So that's that's what this planning process is all about. The pieces that go into this master plan, they'll be a plan for each mode of travel. For walking, there's a pedestrian plan, um, there's a bicycling plan, a motor vehicle plan, and, and all those have a core element. There's also specifics for finance strategies, as well as the implementing code to give teeth to the document and make sure you can implement it as a city. Um, there's important code requirements that go with it. So to, to do all that, we really start with the city's goals and objectives. We look at the transportation-related goals for the city develop evaluation criteria based on those goals and we use that to select with a with a committee which projects make the most sense to plan for so why are we doing this in terms of requirements um, there is a state OAR state transportation planning rule that says every city must have one of these transportation system plans it is the transportation element of your comprehensive plan and as I mentioned before, this is really a long-range look at what you need to, 
manage your facilities and provide services for all users of your system. Some of the things that are, are good about doing these plans is it helps you know how to best spend your dollars when you understand big picture where you need to go with improvements, how to leverage one project to help get another one done, um, how to balance all your limited revenue streams. This master plan really helps you do that. Um, part of that is with an adopted plan, it helps you be ready to go pursue grants to implement projects. Um, most grant opportunities have a requirement that it, any transportation project be adopted in your plan to be competitive for those. Um, so that's an important part of it. Um, and then a little history about what's unique right now compared to the adopted plan you have. Um, back in 2005, you adopted your first transportation system plan. There's a lot of thing that's, things that have changed since then. Um, back when that plan was done, the 20-year horizon was the year 2020. We're getting fairly close to that now, so we're going out to the year 2035 pushing that, that long-range look out. And there's been a lot of amendments to your existing plan since 2005. Um, concept plans that have been completed um, around the city, like the Tonkin Employment Area and um, Adams Avenue North, all those types of concept plans. The city's also grown a lot since 2005. Population has increased, things have changed. And so this is a chance for us to take a new look and see what are the current issues that we're forecasting for the city and make sure the improvement projects that we're recommending still make sense. Okay. Um, one of the, the other major driving forces to this update is actually a metro requirement. Um, they have a new um, set of requirements for all the local agencies in the region to adhere to for compliance. And I described that a little more on the next slide. Uh, metro has always had a regional transportation plan They've recently completed a regional transportation functional plan. There's an F inserted in the acronym now. And out of that are new requirements for all the local agencies to follow. And there's a timeline for all the cities and counties around the region to get their plans updated to comply with that. So Sherwood's in that, um, that timeline right now. So that's a big part of the, the funding from ODOT for the city to complete this is to, to make that compliance happen. What does it really mean for you? There's a certain kind of change in the whole process that we look at. Um, the metro requirements really aim at managing the system. They want you to focus on things like intersection improvements, whether it's a signal upgrade or a turn lane upgrade, and make the most out of the network you have before you bring forward regional projects like widening a corridor to five lanes. And a lot of that's around prioritizing best use of dollars, prioritizing safety, minimizing maintenance costs, things like that. Um, so that's one of the biggest pushes behind this TSP update. They also have introduced some new system measures that we have to look at. Um, things like monitoring freight mobility on Twalton Truett Road and 99W. How is the city's plan affecting freight movement during peak hours on those facilities? Do we have a complete grid of major roadways that allow efficient circulation? Um, some new specific measures like that. So that's, that's really the driving force to all this. To go about meeting those, those needs, our scope of work process, I'll, I'll boil it down to you because that's a lot of boxes to look at, but essentially we go out and we assess what do you have for an infrastructure today? How well is it working? And then we have a 20-year forecast and say with, with growth that would happen in Sherwood and the surrounding urban growth area, how do those needs change? Identify projects to address those needs, prioritize them, come up with a recommendation, and then go through a adoption process. So it's really, again, matching projects with needs. A key part to that and making sure this, this plan is grounded in what the community really wants is the public involvement process. We formed a citizen advisory committee to work with us um, throughout the, the process. We have uh, evening meetings and, and they've learned what a transportation system plan is. We've talked about what the needs in the community are. Right now they're, they're helping us evaluate the potential projects. Um, so they're really a focal part to, to being engaged in this. We also have had two open houses to date where we've gathered input from broader public information up on the city website, announcements in the Sherwood Gazette. Um, I, I think we're scoped for a total of three briefings between planning commission and council um, to make sure we're, we're on the right track heading to the adoption process. 
And then of course there's the, the public hearings when we get ready for adoption. So that's how we make it through that process. And so given all that, all that work we have to do, where do we stand right now? Um, the first thing that we, we have accomplished is that identification of needs that I've talked about, both existing year and looking out 20 years in the future. And we're doing that for all modes, again, walking, biking, taking transit, driving. And the graphics I have shown on the screen there are just some of the tools we've been using with our, our committees and the public to show issue areas or hot spots. Um, the, the bottom two maps are just showing the density of key land uses that would likely generate a lot of walking or biking trips. Um, bottom left is a quarter mile walking distance from generators. And as you get to red on the map, it's more intense, so more likely to see more walking trips there. Same thing on the bottom right for bicycles, a little longer travel distance than, than walking. The red again indicating the likely concentration <clears throat> of cycling trips. And then up on the top, the red represents congestion for driving in the network in the peak hour. Um, the, the line, the red line across the top of the map is Twelfth and Sherwood Road and Roy Rogers looking out 20 years in the future. How congested would that facility be if there was no upgrades made to it with 20 years of growth? Um, and, and we were looking at every intersection through the community and trying to identify those hot spots. So that needs identification has been done. And our next step was starting to identify the solutions. So to do that, we took all the projects that are in your current transportation system plan, all the projects that have been identified in other concept plans or other regional efforts, could be the county's transportation plan, Metro's RTP, Ice Age, Tonkin Trail, any of those projects, and basically dumped them all into one hopper of projects and started to screen them against what your needs are. And so we wanted to make sure we were in alignment with, with what the current needs were. And then to evaluate those and start to help prioritize them, we had our citizen advisory committee help us select evaluation criteria from your transportation goals and policies. And we scored the projects against those, those evaluation criteria. In the end, that will help us have a prioritized list that we can align with funding constraints and help choose which ones are most important which ones might be near-term versus long-term projects. Um, and the final step to that screening process is back to Metro's requirements. We're required to look at, again, things that are lower cost, operational based, like traffic signal enhancements, before we look at major corridor widening projects. Um, so that's a third step in the hierarchy to help us rank these things. So where we're at right now is we have that full project list. We've gone through a technical evaluation of how all that aligns. And we're working with our advisory committee and have shared that draft list with the public because we really want to get people's feedback on how those rankings are looking and hear if those priorities are making sense. Um, and as we've done that, we've already started to flag what we think a subset of projects might be that fit within the revenue constraints the city will have over the next 20 years. And we're looking in a couple scenarios of that. Um, one that's more constrained is a back cast of last five years. What's your average annual revenue been for transportation? And if you project that out for the next 20 years, how much money do you have to work with? And that's about $11 million for city, city money. A different look at it is to acknowledge as a region there's urban growth areas around Sherwood outside of your current city limits that are part of Sherwood's planning area. If that was annexed in and that development happened and there was system development charges or transportation development taxes collected, that generates additional revenue. And that scenario would have about $60 million to apply towards capital improvement projects. So a couple different ways to look at those, those priorities. Um, and again, we're, we're working with our advisory committees to help us try to align those two things. So where do we go from here? Um, I should have mentioned this early on, but we're doing this through an ODOT grant, and that grant expires at the end of June. That's our, our target for the adoption. And so we're moving quickly into trying to refine those project lists and put a draft plan together that we can circulate and get everyone's comments on, um, have additional public feedback, and then I believe it's in April, either late April, early May, start the public hearing process for review and potential adoption. So that is... <coughs> 
our overview. <coughs> Happy to answer any questions you might have. If any I, questions? No? I was just going to say, if I can chime in, um, Mayor, um, this is something that was originally scoped as a work session, but I think based on um, input from you, um, we wanted to give the, the public the benefit of this presentation, right. um, but we certainly want to get feedback from the council on if there's any specific questions you have that you want to make sure we, we address more as we go through the process and also make sure that the public you know, is aware that we're doing this, making, you know, giving them the opportunity to, um, to go to the <coughs> website, find, find the information, and give us comments as well. Any from this end? I've been going to the meetings, so I kind of caught up on it. So, yes, there's no questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're going to go into new business, a city recorder performance evaluation. City manager. There's a document, Mayor and Council, that you're going to be receiving. Um, I think the term is walk on. Um, and I'll turn this over to the city attorney, but uh, basically the staff report and the resolution that is being handed out by the city recorder <coughs> covers the performance evaluation only. The employment agreement will probably be in front of you either two weeks from now or worst case scenario, a month from now. Um, we just need a little bit more time to review that with the city recorder, and that's why that's not part of it. That's what we're hoping to do tonight. So this is really only to go over the performance evaluation that you did with the city recorder publicly and accept the evaluation. So um, with that, I'll hand it off to sure. our city attorney, Pam Berry. Mr. Mayor and Council, thank you. Um, so before you this evening, you have the staff report, a resolution, and the final evaluation form. Um, just by way of background, the city recorder uh, is one of four positions in the city charter that reports directly to you, the council. So it's your responsibility rather than the city managers to evaluate her performance and de determine her terms of her employment. Um, our office is another one of those positions and you have the city manager and the municipal judge, those four. Um, we, um, pursuant to the process that you identified and the criteria that you developed for the evaluation, we um, compiled an evaluation form. Counselors gave us feedback both in writing and during an executive session. And so what you see before you as an attachment represents the compilation of those as we've discussed and agreed. Um, if you approve the resolution tonight, as Joe mentioned, the the outcome would be that that resolution or that excuse me that evaluation form would be approved, and that would conclude the evaluation process for the city recorder. But as Joe said, we need to uh, prepare an updated employment agreement. And we're in the process of working on that, as I think you know, um, and that'll be the next step in the process. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Mr. Mayor and Council, you'll see that there's no resolution number because this was not advertised, and I think you used the term walk-on. So I asked Sylvia how you handle this. this is the first time in my tenure here that we've done this, that she would give you a number uh, this evening, a resolution number to make your motion. 12. Any council comments on this? Okay, I have a resolution 2014-012 approving the final 2014 performance evaluation for the city recorder. Call for a motion. I'll move it. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. So now that's public <coughs> record. Yes. Oh. So, can I ask a question? Go ahead. So Pam, in hopefully in two weeks, we'll have an updated contract for our employee. Yes. And we will. You will approve obviously that contract. We'll see that before our next meeting, yes. right? Oh yes. Okay. It's almost completed. Um, we have a few minor provisions that we need to conclude, um, as I understand it, and I believe that the employee would like a chance to review the agreement as well. So uh, I don't anticipate that event being controversial. We would probably put it on the consent agenda, but it, then at that point the contract will come become public, and we're hopeful to just go have it go into your packet ahead of time so that it's not a walk-on. Okay. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our next one is Resolution 2014-011, amending the fiscal year 2013-2014 fee struct schedule to comply with the state building codes regarding investigative fees. That would be Scott McKee, building official. Good evening. I am Scott McKee, city building official. Do I uh, give a background to? Yeah, just a, a brief um, explanation. <laughs> um, basically, as long as I've been doing this 15 years, the state building codes, national building codes had an investigation fee, and it was dubbed the double permit fee, which meant it was equal to and in addition to the cost of the permit for work being done without a permit. Um, legislation has enacted House Bill 2978, which their intent, I think, is to be more consistent um, throughout jurisdiction to jurisdiction and to be fair to the ones that are getting the, the penalty on them. Um, the bill also says that the building official has a choice of doing an average of, of fees over time, pick an average of what it costs to do the investigation or to um, charge it by actual cost. And I chose to go with actual cost being how much time it takes to do the investigation. I read that. It's, it's what was it, $70 an hour? It's a, our, our typical inspection rate is $70 an hour, and that'll be the minimum fee. And then if it's, if it's a complicated one or one that takes a lot more time, then it'll be Seventy dollars an hour, as much time as it takes. And this is only people violating by not getting a building permit before it goes forward. So it's not any new fee we're in, we're actually getting in. The the code allows the building official to assess a penalty. It's not a mandatory penalty. It's to the discretion of the building official. So in a case where somebody's blatantly trying to get around the laws or be legal, then I can assess this fee. Any council's questions? No? <clears> okay, <throat> resolution 2014 mending. I've read that already. Do we have a motion? I'll move it. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Ordinance 2014-003, temporarily prohibiting the location of medical marijuana facilities within the city of Sherwood and declaring an emergency. Julia Heine, Community Development Director. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, the ordinance before you um, does just what you said. Um, it would temporarily prohibit the siting of medical marijuana facilities. Right now, it's a, a real gray area. It's not um, clearly allowed or not allowed in the code, but beginning... Um, March 1st, there will be the provision through the state to um, allow these facilities to be registered. Um, and so just to give us time, um, the planning department time and the planning commission and ultimately council time to evaluate um, where these facilities would best be cited um, zoning wise and whether or not there should be any um, additional or different regulations, what sort of parking standards, whether or not there's any additional design <coughs> criteria um, to give time to review that, um, we are recommending making it clear that they are not allowed until we are able to get that um, legislation passed. Um, many other jurisdictions are doing something similar. Um, we are proposing 150 days. Um, some jurisdictions are doing 120 days, but they're a little bit further ahead in the, the preparation process. Um, that would basically give us five months to, to go from zero to something that can go go to council and be adopted, which is a fairly tight time frame, honestly, but um, that's the advice that we've been given by our attorneys is really the, the most that they would recommend um, taking on this. Um, so with that, we recommend um, approval of the ordinance. Um, it's my understanding that um, public testimony is at the council's discretion, um, so that's up to you if you wanted to take testimony. It's not a required public hearing, but that is up to your discretion. Do you have any problems with letting me mm -hmm. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so is it my understanding that 
uh, at the end of the 150 days, it just goes away on its own. Unless we do something else or the state does something else or something happens outside of this ordinance, it just it just vaporizes at the end of that time period. Is that how it works? Yes. The t it's a temporary prohibition. It will no longer be prohibited. Um, it, if we don't have something clearly in place, there will be that continued gray area. So it's really important to us that we have something adopted. Um, okay. But it would that prohibition would go away after 150 days. Okay. Thank you. Do I have anybody that wants to testify in regards to it? Okay. I'll bring it back. Go ahead, Sylvia. Do we have a, um, a motion to read caption and adopt? I move we read caption and adopt ordinance 2014-003. Second. All in favor? No, uh, we, oh, we have to do a roll call. Roll call. <laughs> Ordinance 2014-003, a temporary prohibition locating medical marijuana facilities within the city of Sherwood and declaring an emergency. Councilor Clark? Aye. Councilor Langer? Aye. Councilor Butterfield? Aye. Councilor Folsom? Aye. Councilor Grant? Aye. Councilor President Henderson? Aye. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Thank you. Now we'll move on to resolution 2014-009 authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with general pacific inc to supply an advanced metering infrastructure system and city manager who do you want to explain this one actually i'm going to quickly hand it off to craig sheldon who's been working on this project i think you told me today since 2005 you've been exploring this as uh as an option, so um, he's going to explain the background. I know you have a few members of the public that want to um, testify about this uh, proposal. Um, he will go through it. You may recall this was part of the budget process, so the $300,000 is in the budget. Um, this is just to move the project to its next step. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Craig Sheldon, our public works director, who will provide many more details than what I'm providing. So go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, so yeah, I'll give a little more than on the staff report. Uh, so back in 2006, 2005, somewhere right around there, the city actually was looking at uh, partnering with PGE to bring AMI at that time into the city of Sherwood smart meters. Uh, PGE moved forward with their project. We have AMI PGE meters throughout the city currently. Uh, the city of Sherwood, we were doing a long-term water line project and we chose not to partner with PGE at that time. Uh, there was some stuff with broadband, PGE back then we were looking at, and it just didn't work out. So PGE does have their system implemented and in place. Again, in 2008, we brought utility billing back in-house. Uh, as you know, we've had some issues with the billing process. Um, the issue there is we, uh, when you went to monthly billing, which we all knew this, we were reading meters uh, every other month. Uh, we brought it back in-house. It was double the work, pretty much. You're reading mo monthly instead of every two months. Uh, you're creating more bills going out. So act actually in 2008, we started thinking about how we were going to move forward to move back around and save some money uh, efficiency-wise. Um, so then in 2011, at the city council goal setting, we discussed initiated an AMI or an AMR program uh, during that session in January. And uh, we had the issues with the billing, so we weren't at the point that I felt comfortable moving forward to bring it back to you. So last uh, budget process, we brought in $300,000, uh, asking for $300,000 to move forward uh, with this project. And then again in the fall, early fall, September, end of August, somewhere around there, we had a work session on the AMI and AMR project. We're not the only agency out there uh, that has it. Uh, Gresham, Olympia, Longview, uh, Forest Grove, there's a variety of cities out there, Wilsonville, uh, that have the AMR or AMI. AMI is a little farther along uh, than AMR uh, through the process and a little more efficient that you don't have to do drive-bys and all that. You actually do it off your computer. Uh, Security-wise, the city does have an identity uh, theft uh, po policy that we use. We actually, uh, the, the inf information coming through the system that the city will see, you'll see the reading and consumption, no different than we see now, and we'll see uh, a recorder number which identifies uh, that device. You don't see anything from personal property or anything like that through this system. You, that's what you see every month. Uh, moving, that's what you would see. 
So we have $300,000 in this year's budget. Uh, there's customer benefits on this, uh, this program as well as the city has some benefits too. Uh, over the next, uh, if we were to do it in five years, it's going to be a little rocky going for the five years. You're still going to have to have the meter reader doing some reading, but after five years, uh, you would be implemented if we were able to put $300,000 towards it each year. Um, so with that, um, November we issued an RFP. We issued the RFP for a whole system because we want to lock in a price on a multi-year contract. One, we don't want it changing. We just had lead laws go into place that we can't use some of the brass after January of this last year. Uh, you know, there's quite a bit of cost. If we would have went in 2005, we would have saved. We wouldn't have been dealing with the lead stuff in the meters and, and as we move forward now, but we didn't go that direction. Uh, so then we also have what's called a water management conservation plan, which calls out our water loss uh, and leak detection requirements for going to the Willamette uh, when we chose that route. So yeah, our water loss shows in those plans 6 to 8 percent, I would say, 10 uh, percent being a kind of a where you really need to start doing stuff. 15% is excessive water loss. The problem is when the master plan was done in 2005 and the water management plan was done and probably was worked on in about 2008, there was no data before 2002 that was efficient data because of record keeping in the city before about 2000, 2001. So when TVWD applied some of that information, it spells right out in the water management conservation plan that that information wasn't, there wasn't a lot of information before 2002. Um, so we actually do water audits through the state that this system would help us provide that information. It better uh, analyze our system better. Uh, more data would be produced for uh, future councils to uh, set rates and, and move that if that's a direction the council wanted to go. But we would have better data to do our jobs than we have right now. Picture kind of we talked about over the last several months We've talked about a parks refurbishment plan. We've talked about a facilities plan. We've talked about equipment vehicle replacement plan. Water meters are no different. AWWA standards, American Water Works, 20 years on a water meter. You start out 1.5% when they're brand new, one way. So 98.5% 98, 98 to 101.5% is your, your uh, accuracy in those. Over time, they depreciate. There's issues, water loss. So when you take a look at this growth that happened in Sherwood, no different than the other plans, you got meters in the next five years that are going to be coming up on 20 years. We can either do something about it moving forward now in a plan, or we can sit back and wait till they're not accurate. And that's what ends up happening. That's why a lot of cities choose to go this direction with uh, moving towards AMI or AMR. It's not something new to the water industry. Like if you live here in Sherwood now, you have your Northwest Natural Gas gets read through an AMR. They're not an AMI system, but it's still similar. Uh, they, I think they would like to have, I don't want to speak for the gas company, but there's some benefits to the fixed system that we're looking at, that they have gone the other direction in the AMR. Um, so that's some background. So in November, we issued an RFP. Like I said, we, we issued it for a host site versus uh, a city, to be able the city to produce that information through our servers. We wanted to compare the cost. We uh, went through, we had four vendors supply uh, information. We narrowed it down to two vendors that would work for Sherwood. Um, from that point, we did field demonstrations. We put antennas up within the city of Sherwood. We ran data uh, fr from different locations. We put meters in the ground. That was on their cost. And we made the selection criteria off of that, what worked for our system, what worked for our billing system. So he here we are today with $1.3 million asking for over the next five or six years. It's not going to be addition. What, it what it's going to be, it's going to come through our O&M budget. It's not a capital project. If we don't have the money, we're not doing it. We've got to do some sort of meter replacement anyways. But the bigger cost savings is right now, when you double that meter reading position, you're spending between meter reading, we were spending $52,000 roughly with when we were doing it when we first, when we were doing uh, bi-monthly. You're about $98,000. So you take that down, your meter reading position down to about ten to twelve thousand dollars. You're not going to be reading meters. You're still going to have to do a little bit of customer service uh, as you move forward. But you're not going to have the meter reading out there, and you're going to be able to use that meter reader and other soft programs that we're not actually complying in some areas on right now. Instead of me coming back and asking for more staff uh, to be able to accomplish this or contract stuff out, this is a way that we're not looking at just meter maintenance here. We're looking at the whole picture of 
the meter reading program, the billing program. Uh, you're going to save some costs in the billing side, too, here with staff-wise. They're going to be able to work on other functions. It's not going to be a lot. Your biggest saving is your meter reader, cost of equipment to read meters, as well as the vehicle. You're still going to have to do meter maintenance somewhat. Uh, you're still going to have to go out and trim bushes around uh, the vegetation. You're still going to have to uh, do some of those things, but you're actually going to save on the actual monthly meter reading of that position, as well as vehicle replacement costs. So when you broke it down uh, to what's it's about a seven-year payback if you did it uh, right away, I think we could spread it out and still get the same advantage over the next five years, you're going to have a ton of meters. I think you've probably got 3,200 of them out there right now that need to be, something needs to be done with them. And as the years go out to 18, so everything from 20 years ago, from when we get to 2018, 19, they're going to all be coming due, no different than our life expectancy on our other assets. So, and you know, I know there's been questions a lot about water rates, and what I can tell you is in the water business, uh, uh, there's a lot of fixed costs. It's not just, uh, and I, I think you, uh, I know Councilor Grant and Mayor Middleton's have said on uh, the regional water supply, and they, they talked about it this last year, 85 to 90 percent of your cost in the water business <coughs> are uh, fixed cost. So th these are ways that you have to invest to be able to save money down the road. And this is a, you know, I know there's security issues that people have out there probably with it, but this is a way you can save money. It's not going to happen tomorrow unless we did everything and build it all in one year to get your payback at five years or whatever. But I think you take it over time and you do it. And that's why you see the $1.3 million in here. It's over time. If we don't have the money in the budget, we don't do it. Thing is, I didn't want to have to come back every time we wanted to go buy a water meter. That's why we did the whole multi-year contracts. We have plenty of multi-year contracts throughout the city that we bid, so I really don't see any harm in this part of it. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Go ahead. Um, Craig, there are concerns about security. Could, could you describe the concerns and, and, and let us know what your thoughts are on them? Well, I've heard a variety of things, uh, you know, about getting them people's information, being able to, we've, we've heard, being able to see in people's house, uh, being able to watch through, you know, PG's heard how they can see through their water meter. Uh, that's not what we're after. We're after the, the, the data. Our, our meter reader could gather more information out there by hand with the M MVRSs if we really wanted to for code compliance and everything else. We don't do that. We want to know the radio number. We want to know the consumption. And that's all we care about. We want to have the analytical parts so you guys can make your best decision when it comes to rate. We've heard a lot of complaints about water rates. There's more than just the water. There's the whole utility bill. And this is a way in the future that if council wanted to go and look at different directions on how to, you know, one of the things we hear is conservation and how can we save money on our water bill when you have fixed rates are so high, all your fixed rates are high, and we're only using a bare minimum. Well, there's ways of peaking, and there's ways for demand that you can, the water industry is a little late versus the other utilities and charging some of those things, but it's doable, but you got to have the data before you can do it, and we don't have the data for that. And I think that beats in, goes into your conservation. There's all kinds of, you know, everybody's got a different opinion on the security part. But what I know is what we're looking for in the water business, we're looking for the consumption and we're looking for the radio number and that's what was provided to us. We're not looking, like I said, we, we went out to a host site to see what that would cost. We have an internal server, everything's going to come back to the city. It's, there's not going to be a third party. There's not going to be a third party uh, in this contract to install the meters or anything. The city of Sherwood's going to install them. Mm -hmm. Staff's going to do that. So. Can you tell me the acronyms? AMI, AMR? So there's automatic meter reading system, and back when we, uh, it's a drive by kind of approach. It's, right. Uh, but there's still some issues with that, you know, uh, and then the automatic meter infrastructure uh, system, AMI. And there's more you could do with the AMI. Really, what's going to go on is if a customer calls in, we're not going to have to come out and do a reread. It's click. It's picking up so many reads in a day off of that. And when you call in, when it's all implemented, the utility billing office is going to be able to hand it, handle your call right there. We're not going to have to go out and get a read or whatever. It's all going to be done through the office. It's not going to be so that you know 
that saves time there too. There's a variety of things you can do with AMI in the future, you know, we're not asking for a big Cadillac system here. You could actually shut, you could actually put valves in the meter system and shut their water off when they needed it turned off. We're not going that direction. <coughs> if the city chooses to go that direction someday with this system, you could do that. But we're not asking to do that. We're asking, we're, we're strictly dealing with the re meter reading at this time to save money. So what I hear you saying is as far as our natural gas and PGE, they already have systems that are very similar automated in place yeah. in Sherwood. Yeah, and you know, I think the gas company, they probably would have really looked at AMI, but they don't have power poles, they don't have, so they can put antennas, so they're kind of, their stuff's all underground. Right. And uh, they don't have those options out there like the power company. Right, so they already did the automated, me automated meter reading. So then the second thing that I heard was with the aging um, utility vehicles that we already have, or the meters on the houses, we have to do something, meaning they're going to either need to be replaced with an old um, and outdated piece of equipment or look to the future and go ahead when they need to be replaced and update them. And that's what you're saying, like the 3,200 houses, those are um, likely aging into the point that they need to be replaced? True, and I think also you look at uh, some businesses out there that have vaults that the meter reader has to get in now that takes two people to go out because you're dealing with a confined space just to get a meter read to be mm. in compliance with Oregon OSHA. I think there's, there's, uh, there's that. There's, you know, in the last probably year and a half, don't hold me this number, but I'll bet you we've changed out 170 meters uh, just in the last year and a half. The fortunate thing is, and probably in the last 10 years, the meters that we install, we're only going to have to change out the register and still get another 10 years life. We're not going to have to get rid of the complete meter. It's the older meters, the ABBAs and stuff that, which is a technical term, sorry, but that's, <laughs> you know, you've got, you, you've got stuff that's probably 1990, 93 that's still on the ground. And that's what your basin, uh, your basin, the city's revenue off of stuff that's been in the ground 20 some years that, a life expectancy is 20 years. So. And it's inefficiently reading at this point at the um, minimum, and, and it could be costing us money. I do know a friend of mine had a water leak in a rental, and uh, they were grateful that the city was able to tell them because it was a pretty significant situation. So you're saying that that sort of thing will be detected likely much quicker with the AMI situ system. The office people, they'll be, it'll be set per, once we're completely deployed, like I said, when you're doing part of the system at a time, it's going to take a while to get there, but once you're completely deployed, it's going to bring a red flag up that there's an issue at a house and you're going to catch a, somebody's got higher use than the meter reader going out once a month and then catching it. Yeah, there's rebates and stuff that you can get and leak adjustments, but that's our water loss, and every year we have to go through conservation measures for the salmon in the river on the Willamette River and gauge that river. There's a whole process. We have to have a leak detection program in place, and, and we do that on the public side. So when you're reading the 6-7% in the water master plan, that's our distribution system. That's not the 355,000 units on the private side that we lost or some of those different, every year is different on that, but that's some of the stuff we talked in work sessions. So, some of the other agencies that have done this, I mentioned Olympia, Longview, Bend, Redmond, Gresham, Portland. Tigard's done an AMI. Portland actually is doing a pilot program, AMR and AMI. Wilsonville, Newburgh, Sunrise Water District, and Forest Grove right around here. Um, so, and there's other benefits to the customer side too. Um, but it's not a new, this has been all over the place. Okay, thank you, I'm, I'm done. Sorry. No Councilor Butterfield. So, Craig, are you planning on using a hybrid of AMR and AMI, or are you leaning towards one over the other? I think eventually for all our water uh, audits and uh, all the reporting that we have to do to the state on the water use, I think eventually we would look at going with the AMI system. It's just a better system for us, fixed-wise. We're not going to have some of the issues that we that we've heard from the gas company on some of theirs that they had. Uh, you get cars parked over certain things, you can't get reads at the time, and you gotta continue to drive. You still gotta have a vehicle to do the driving. Uh, but you can take your AMI and you can tie it into your uh, 
I don't want to go into some of our security things related to our water system, but you tie it all together eventually. It might be 10 or 15 years out, but you have all your data, your input and water coming in, your consumption going out, your production water, everything's registered through a system. And it's, it's easier for the, when the auditors come in here for the finance department, you have your production water, your consumption water. It's, I mean, there's cut and dry. You have your leak, lo leak, leak detection loss. I mean, there's a variety of things you can do. You can tie it to your GIS system. Uh, we're not going there. I mean, our main focus right now is getting stuff in the ground so we can save money. And that's going to get our cost of meter reading back down to below what it was when we were doing by weekly. And that's our main focus. And 90% of your meters are in a vault in the ground. They don't have video cameras on them. They don't have audio on them. All they do is send data back to... That's what we're going. You're going to have a radio, a little radio deal inside that meter box. It's going to send the stuff back. And it's going to take. You can have whatever direction you end up going. You can it can record every few hours or a couple times a day how you have it set up. Yeah. Then when you're all done with the system, what are our benefits? What are we saving as far as workload on your half? Well, behalf I think goes. I think you're saving about $88,000 in meter reading costs that you're not going to have to do because of monthly costs. That's not just meter reading. That's customer. You're still going to have to do some customer service, but that's into that ten to $12,000 range. You're, you're saving benefits, uh, overhead that we get charged in the utility part of it. You're saving that cost. You're saving salary. Uh, you're saving a replacement vehicle for the meter reader to be out reading water meters and running around all the time. You're going somewhat green. That's how Gresham got theirs back when the ARRA, they got uh, some sort of green grant because you're going, your carbon footprint, uh, that's how they, they worked it there. But uh, you're saving that cost. You're going to save some billing cost. You're, you're, uh, you're able to put, uh, you know, are you going to just completely fold the maintenance worker position that's uh, currently doing that? I'd say no. We have a lot of soft cost programs such as uh, our fat and oil grease, we can do more on. We can do uh, more on our private water qualities, which is clean water services mandates on that. Uh, conduct water use audits, PRV maintenance. We've got a variety of systems out there that have PRVs on the back side of the water meter that was installed with high pressure lines went in. They're going to be failing here in the next probably five. We've already had issues with them. So uh, those are maintenance projects. You have uh, Currently, we have conservation. I think we're meeting the bare minimum by using the regional supply. We're not completely uh, where we need to be. We're using the regional water supply, but there's some things that we need to be doing part of our permit. And those things, when you have Hillsboro, TBWD, or whoever's going to draw water out of the Willamette, those things got to be met in our requirement. Right now with Sherwood, it's pretty easy to meet that, but those things are coming down the road. Uh, as well as... Uh, there's a variety of other soft programs in the utility part that that position would probably work on. So, yeah, are you getting rid of a position? No, you're not getting rid of a position. Am I coming back asking for another position in the utility side? That's not the plan. Our plan is to make an investment here, go this direction, use that position in other areas. But that position won't be a full-time position. It'll be down to... One twenty, one one tenth a, of the time. It will be a, it won't be for meter reading. Yes, it'll be down to one tenth of a time, probably filling in for that part of it. So, one fully deployed, and these other programs are where we'd be working at. Now, that's not including the other sides of public works, such as streets, parks, facilities. Right. And, but this is talking utility wise. Okay. So, I guess you're you're kind of saving money in one area, but you're able to get other things done that you're not working on. Is what I'm saying right. without coming back asking for something. <coughs> <clears throat> Just have a question about the company you chose, General Pacific Inc. Um, and if you could just explain how will their software uh, integrate or be compatible with our, the software that the, current, the city currently has in place. So uh, that was part of the criteria. They have to, it has to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they were able to do coming out, the other, the other company that was took second, they had a good product. Uh, they had a lot of bells and whistles on their products. We're not, like I said, we're not going after the Cadillac. And the other companies, they've invested more money probably into further developing their system. I do not want to bring a system in here that we're going to have to try to do what we did in utility billing. We don't right. have the time to do that. Um, this system's more proven. 
General Pacific sells, which is the Itron, uh, versus the other company. Uh, I think they'll eventually get with the bells and whistles. They just kind of they put a product out there, and they've kind of it's been successful for them, and they haven't really pushed it. Uh, but I definitely think that they're going to get the other bells and whistles. They're just not there yet. Uh, everything that I've heard through the team that uh, evaluated it was positive, mm -hmm. and both of them were positive. It's just, again, we're not looking for the Cadillac system out there. We're looking for what's going to work in Sherwood to get our jobs done. I mean, that's, that's really the bottom line. And, um, you know, like I said, we're not looking for a Cadillac system. Okay. Thank you. We had a few people that wanted to speak on this. The first one would be Kurt Christensen. Kurt Christensen, 22520 Southwest Fair Oaks Court in Sherwood, Oregon. In my younger years, uh, I was a project manager on the oil, on the Trans Alaska Oil and Gas Pipeline, and I know a little bit about valves, and I know a little bit about electronics in the ground, and I wouldn't put my money on putting any electronics in the ground, in particular where I live, uh, which uh, where the water valve is, it's underwater several times uh, each year. So if you're going to put it, uh, these valves, uh, I would suggest that you consider uh, some kind of pole system where it's definitely above ground. Overall, I have no doubt that eventually this may be the way to go. Uh, I always prefer when these big projects, they come around, that we do a solid pilot project in-house. I'm not convinced that all this outsourcing is a long-term healthy way to go. You lose a lot of control, uh, you lose a lot of flexibility and in-house ability to make decisions. And I think given the security issues that we've had lately with how clever people are getting with snooping, that I wouldn't want uh, too many outside contractors to have uh, a T3 access to the city of Sherwood. Uh, hackers today, uh, they once they have a pathway they can drive at, they get pretty clever on how they can hack into associated systems. I would much prefer that you do a pilot project uh, three to five years, uh, look at how well you can work it in-house, get some counseling on engineering counseling on how to do that, um, and then move slowly ahead. I think that there are probably already customers out there that would say, um, put a valve on my system, and I would work with those people and get some data going. I'm not convinced that there are savings in this little gimmick. I think that uh, you, I don't think you're going to lose your, or abolish the position that currently is doing the water metering. Um, and I, I have seen projects like this with these fancy electronics, they tend to end up not less, but more. So a pilot project would definitely, in my mind, be the way to go. The other side of this is, in 2005, we were promised very reasonable water rates. We haven't gotten them. We're now one of the most expensive water systems in the greater metropolitan system. And we have, just this year, turned down a proposed necessary water increase. And we probably have three to four, maybe five years of increases coming down the pike, I would really, at my age, prefer to be prudent and use the money to pay down some of the debts that we have. I don't have anything against, at the same time, running a prudent pilot project, but I really don't want to spend $1.5 million on this without having done our due diligence and without having 
paid down our loan balance a little bit better than we're doing right now. My water bill in the summertime is so high that uh, I'm looking at um, going desert. It's hard to afford a garden in the city of Sherwood with the water rates that you're currently giving us. So factor all that in. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Did you want to answer some of his questions, or did you want to get back with him later? It's fine. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shannon? Neil Shannon, 23997 Southwest Redfern Drive. <clears throat> wow. What can I say in four minutes? But uh, let's start off with the fact I am a member of the Budget Committee, and I was at the budget meetings last year when the $300,000 was added to the Water Bureau budget. Um, contrary to perhaps some mistakes, the Budget Committee does not approve uh, the use of the AMR system. We allocated funds based on the request of the Water Bureau, the Water Department, at the time, um, they indicated that they would be going through to justify the AMR systems, which, and then they did at a, at a future date. I've also had the opportunity to, to attend the work sessions from the, uh, that were pre present, presented by the Water Bureau, and uh, so I'm fairly familiar with what um, uh, has been presented. I have some real issues with this. I do believe that the cost and the payback benefits are not there. Uh, Craig has pointed out benefits of about seven years. Uh, I've worked in industry. I'm an engineer. I've had to do uh, uh, return on investment calculations. And I know that if I could give them a return on investment of three years, it was a slam dunk. If I could give them five years, I might be able to get it as long as the project met uh, the goals of the organization. Quite honestly, a seven-year payback is not very good at all. And not only that, but I question the, uh, uh, the payback uh, analysis. As Craig has pointed out, he's not reducing any labor at this point, although he may not have future labor costs that he did discuss. Um, at the uh, budget committee meeting, when um, Craig met uh, with the budget committee, Craig indicated that if the uh, budget committee did not approve the AMR system, that um, they would probably need a contingency of about $12,000 a year uh, for uh, maintenance of advanced maintenance of the existing meter system. So basically, if we don't approve this, we're looking at an added cost of about $12,000 per year. So I, I'm, as I say, I question the, 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 the cost analysis of this. Craig also testified at the Budget Committee that they have uh, reviewed the, um, uh, the leak systems at that time, and he, in fact, said, quote, we have few leaks, unquote. Um, the, uh, my concerns about privacy uh, still exist also. Not so much that I am worried about um, the, the city uh, misusing the data, although I do have some concerns about that. I would be very concerned if you started uh, coming up with uh, uh, concepts of, uh, you know, billing more at noon than you did at 6 p.m. kind of thing. Uh, but the fact is that the systems would clearly allow a third party to drive down the street and read the meters themselves. And if they wanted to, a third party could publish that data. They could put signs on your lawn that says, this guy uses too much water because the data is not secured. I also worry by the fact that the city of Sherwood is acting as a utility, and, um, uh, but the city has no liability. I have less worries about data and security with PGE and Northwest Natural Gas. They're private companies. If they screw up, they're going to be paying for it by liability. Um, I have emailed you uh, much of my concerns. I hope you've had the opportunity to read that. But quite honestly, while I do support the, the concept of perhaps replacing as many as 350 meters uh, that are uh, three-quarter inch and larger, 
for replacing 4,500 meters of 5 eighths diameter, which are the residential meters. Again, I seriously question. Thank you. Nancy Taylor. Nancy Taylor, resident Sherwood. Um, I oppose the AMI only because as a rate payer, if I'm going to pay additional higher rates, I would like to know that a human being got benefits from it rather than um, this system that we're talking about today. Um, I do think that water will be the conversation of the future, water rights, and we aren't talking about that. We're talking about a facility to gather information about the water, to make billing easier, to make shutoff easier, etc. So I oppose it completely. And I couldn't add any more to what was just told to you because these two men behind me are very, very bright. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a form filled out on this? No? Yours is on, you, you didn't want it on this one, did you? On the water meters, you've got zeros. You you've got the other one. On the uh, transportation plan. Yep. You bring it back. Bring it back to council. Do I have any questions on it? I just got some basic comments. Go ahead. We all have iPhones. We all have computers at home. We all have electronics. And every day there's someone out there trying to hack into a system someplace. It's just part of the world that we live in. With. So I don't think any of us are going to be safe from people trying to hack into our lives. I don't think that the meter system that we have is very a gateway to invite hackers. I mean, what are they going to get other than flow rates? So I'm not concerned about the technology and the security of the system. So that's just my okay, Craig, I had one question. The ones you're going to put this on are the ones we'd have to replace anyway, correct? Right. So it is kind of a pilot program, and if it didn't, if it didn't work to our satisfaction, we're not committed for the whole million something, are right. we? Right. It's pending our budget. Okay. And that's how we'll sign. That's how everything's worded. Uh, you know what? We come and ask for. Well, we're not going to come ask if there doesn't balance the budget out and during the budget process and. Uh, next year for so much money and if it's not there we're not coming asking we're not spending the two million dollars or the 1.5 million dollars that's coming back from Wilsonville on this project if we wanted to do that and that's a choice you guys can make that's not what I'm proposing the, the whole thing here is is you have a better payback the seven years on this is if it takes us five full years to do this if it if we wanted to do it all in one year and have a better payback of five years or you know 5.7 years I get where uh, Neil's talking about the three years and the four years, and I understand that. But we're putting this out. We're not. That's why we're stretching it out to seven years. It's not something that we're going to do in the first year to try to go out and change it. I would say probably those meters, as well as we're going to hit the ones that have registers on them, that we can just uh, do a lot cheaper. To, to get our bang for a dollar there. So I would say the ones that need to be changed out that we're having issues with or potential issues and then the ne and the easy ones of changing the registers out. That's where you're, gonna, you're not going to have to buy the full meters. And we're really going to look at the larger meters too at the beginning because if we can save on confined space entry and everything else, that's what we're going to get our bigger bang for a dollar. So. I think it's good. I mean, it, it, it to me, it is a pilot project. If it's yeah. no good by next year and, and it's not working and we're having problems, then it's done. So, right. I, I would agree so. with you, Mayor. Mayor. Mayor, can I add something? Go ahead. Um, I wanted to address the rate issue. When we just brought the rate study forward, this was contemplated in that study to do this entire project over a period of time. So this isn't an additional project that would raise those rates. This project was part of that rate study we brought forward earlier this year. Thank you. Okay. So I just, I just want to make just a clarification um, because when I read enter into a multi-year contract, 
um, and I know you addressed that a little bit, um, that just makes me nervous. So it is a no obligation. It's not necessarily just that it doesn't fit the budget, but if we are dissatisfied with the project, the, the product is not working the way that we thought that it would. It's a, it's a multi-year contract. Uh, it's no different than we have a variety of different contracts out there for multi-years. There are clauses in it that the city can get, I mean, we can get out. So no different than you hire a contractor that doesn't perform. We give them notice through how we can do it legally and we remove them from the job. I mean, this is similar to that. So if you sign a contract with Horizon or somebody to buy our turfus material or our fertilizer in parks for three years, uh, and it's not working out, we're not getting, they change their product. We're gonna give them, provide them notice through the contract language and we're gonna get out of the contract. Okay, so next year you'll bring back the results of the first year? Most certainly. All right. It'll probably be as soon as we can get the stuff purchased and get stuff, it's gonna take us a little bit to get in the ground, but we'll have information for you. And you know, we did test the meters. We did, we put devices up and the data come back clean. I mean, it worked, so I'm, I feel pretty comfortable right now with the not, what I know about the system. So, I, I I think it seems prudent to start the project. We we have the money budgeted to have it be a pilot project. They have to be replaced. These meters that we're looking at. Um, so it seems to me that it's a good pilot project to to start out and. If it's something that we find is not feasible, it's not going to raise our rates, then we can always next year say it really wasn't cost effective. Do I have a motion? I've, I've got a couple. Oh, couple. I'm sorry. Counselor. Craig, the other neighboring municipalities that have been doing it for a while, um, roughly how long have some of them been doing it and what kind of feedback have you heard from them? Rich, can you come up and answer that? You're the one that talked to the other agencies. Uh, Rich Sattler with the Public Works Department. Yes, yeah, so when we were doing our research and talking to other agencies, doing our background checks, there's some new systems as uh, new as two years. Gresham did a full implementation, and they're seeing uh, fruitions of that implementation for their uh, reading system. And there's other systems that have gone over through multiple years and just keep adding, replacing the meters and adding to their system and continue to upgrade that system as well, moving from a drive-by system more to a um, system where they don't have to drive by anymore. So we, we've heard good feedback. They're getting good, good information out there and they're seeing those efficiencies. Do I have any other questions from council? I just have a question. Julie, can, you mentioned um, <clears throat> the recent rate study. Could you elaborate on that a little bit for folks in the audience and maybe those residents who review this later because they may not understand what you're referencing? Yeah. Last fall, um, we completed a water rate study to see if our rates were where they should be, if they needed to go up, down. And um, we had a staff and the contractor had recommended a 1% rate increase and council chose to forego that increase for now because we're also doing a master plan update and we'll be um, updating methodologies for SDCs. And so we're gonna wait until that master plan is done and then reevaluate the rates. But part of that rate study was what are our operational needs and what are our capital needs? And this project was a project that was part of that analysis. And then, Rich, um, you, or Craig, you mentioned Ben, Portland, Tigard, Wilsonville, Forest Grove, and Newburgh. Is that correct? Yeah. So has one of these communities completely automated their system, or are they doing it in phases the way you've recommended? Um, Gresham is completely automated. So they received a, a large funding um, as uh, through a grant, as Craig mentioned, and they were uh, obligated to put that in within a year. So. It was a very tight schedule. They had a contractor do that, and theirs has been operational and, and working. Um, and the, like I say, the other agencies, they, they continue <laughs> to add as their budget allows right. to continue to uh, have these efficiencies out there. That, uh, one thing that um, we need to also mention is, Craig mentioned safety. Well, there's also 
sometimes you have injuries when you're out there lifting uh, large lids that we have on some of these meters. So mm -hmm. that, that's also another benefit to us. And one thing I, I, I think this will put you a little bit at ease is that the system that we have, these are 20-year warrantied systems. The first 10 years is 100% replaced, and there's a proration on those after the, the, the later 10 years. So um, they, they come with a pretty good backing out there um, on their product. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Grant, do you have any? Oh, no, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll move. <clears throat> Excuse me. We adopt resolution 2014-009, authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with General Pacific Incorporated to supply an advanced meter metering infrastructure, um, in parentheses, AMI system. I'll second. second. Who's first? <laughs> <laughs> Matt. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, staff. Next, we're going to go into public hearings. Ordinance 2014-004, approving an amendment to the transportation system plan and comprehensive plan regarding extension and designation of Southwest Langer Farms Parkway north of Highway 99 and west. And, Mayor and Council, I do need to read a public hearing statement for right. these legislative items. The Sherwood City Council will hold a public hearing this evening to hear testimony on two separate ordinances. Ordinance 2014-004, approving an amendment to the transportation system plan and comprehensive plan regarding extensions and designation of Southwest Langer Farms Parkway, north of Highway 99W and west. And Ordinance 2014-005, approving an amendment to the transportation system plan and comprehensive plan regarding extension and designation of Southwest Baylor Way, north of 12th and Sherwood Road. The purpose of the hearing is to provide the public with an opportunity to submit testimony on the above said items. The order of business the council will follow is to hear a staff report, receive any correspondence, receive public testimony, and then receive additional comments from staff. Questions from the council will follow. The hearing will then be closed. No further testimony will be received. Discussion by the council will follow. Any interested person may present testimony. If you wish to speak, please fill out one of the testimony forms and submit them to the city recorder. The mayor will recognize those persons wishing to speak, and any questions should be addressed through the mayor. When you come to the microphone, please state your name and address for the record, as this hearing will be recorded, and please limit your testimony to four minutes. And Mayor Middleton, if I um, may, there's um, this is a legislative hearing, which is why Sylvia read the legislative hearing script, but it, um, it does also have an applicant, and traditionally, at least at the Planning Commission, we follow the same um, hearing schedule as a quasi-judicial where the applicant has 30 minutes to present after the staff um, has presented their um, staff report. The applicant has 30 minutes to present to be split between um, their initial opening remarks and any rebuttal at the end. Um, we've, we recognize that's a long time at the council meeting where you've got a lot of other things going on. I kind of gave the applicant a heads up that that might be limited, but it's up to you whether or not you wanted to allow the applicant sort of time outside of that four minute limitation to um, to speak and I, my recommendation if you are willing would be to say after Brad has given his um, presentation to give the applicant an opportunity to briefly touch on any points that Brad didn't cover and then have some time at the end of the hearing as well to respond to anything that came up and you can set any time limits you want or choose to not give them any time it's up to you all right thank you Brad Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and the Council. Uh, tonight, this is actually for our record keeping is uh, PA 1303. And what it is, is it's a proposal by Washington County to extend, um, and this is, both of these you'll see tonight are simply putting lines onto the plans, onto the transportation system plan maps, so that in the future, as these properties develop that we're going to be talking about, there is some direction to the property owner that gives them some sort of regulatory certainty that says, hey, this is the <laughs> facility that the city expects is going to be constructed on that as you're developing your property. And so um, in this instance, this is a property that's just, uh, um, it's west because of the way we're, we are, we're oriented, west and north of uh, Home Depot at the signalized intersection. And currently, I'm going to point with the laser so you'll have to look up there. Um, there are two accesses that this property 
this this little axis right here gives property this property this which is a little triangular piece and this property which is a much larger piece access to Southwest Roy Rogers Road neither one of those two properties have access onto Highway 99 and for that reason that property specifically this one has been marketed quite a bit um, by the family that owns it has not been able to develop so as part of looking at the widening of Southwest Roy Rogers Road uh, the county saw that there were going to be some issues with having that access currently in the location that it is because it is a full access meaning that people could theoretically come out of that driveway and take a left onto 12th and Sherwood Road crossing that uh, traffic and so it creates um, some conflict there and that property is owned commercial as you can see um, the property the red dash line in this is the uh, actual city limits and then the green line up there is the urban growth boundary um, so to develop that portion that rear portion of the property that we're talking about here they're gonna have to annex into the city but there's really not anybody wanting to talk to them about uh, developing their property without having um, an understanding of what the access is going to look like in the future um, the county is proposing to identify the future of uh, in the future of the TSP that area as a collector by designating a collector it allows the property owners um, which are zoned for general commercial and light industrial to um, take their traffic out to that signalized intersection and then also as they build the facility they could um, ask for uh, credits to the transportation development tax uh, for building that facility so dedicating and building it would allow them to having it designated as a collector as opposed to a local would allow them to ask for that credit but also for the benefit to the city having that designated as a collector as those properties develop out intensely then there is the potential that they will um, generate quite a bit of traffic because of their zoning <clears throat> again here's the zoning the light industrial the general commercial I suspect if that property that's in the urban growth boundary is brought into the uh, city limits that you'd be looking at a somewhat similar commercial designation and that property has some limitations we can talk about that here in a few seconds um, what we're asking you to do or the recommendation from the Planning Commission after um, having had two hearings um, we had a hearing in December uh, 10th and then again on January 28th to consider these applications um, they're proposing or they're recommending that the City Council go ahead and adopt this legislation and put these onto this map this is our functional classification map and as you can see and as I am pointing right here with the laser pointer there's really nothing right here to designate that so what you would see is at this intersection you would see that dash line that I had shown you earlier um, just a few things we some people have referred to this as Adams Avenue there was uh, ac action by council I believe in 2010 um, or actually 2011 uh, city ordinance 2011-10 which redesignated Adams Avenue to Langer Farms Parkway so all of Adams Avenue is now Langer, Farm, Langer Farms Parkway we spoke to the access um, the count the county has proposed these obviously for the safety that I spoke about at the intersection there um, and then they also look at it as an opportunity to, to provide access to those properties um, the forecasted traffic generation that uh, their traffic engineers came up with in a worst-case scenario if that property was to develop out as the, at the most intense use based on the type of zoning that we have you could see an average of 5,000 daily trips in that area so it would probably warrant a collector it's probably not likely that you're gonna see that um, we still are suburban so you see suburban type commercial and industrial development not that high intense uh, industrial and commercial development there were questions um, that were also raised at the um, Planning Commission that I wanted to speak to you about there are folks that live over in this neighborhood um, at Hunters Ridge and then the neighbor next to this and initially when the county had their meetings with these folks their neighborhood meeting they had shown that there was um, maybe a future connection across here highly 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 unlikely that that would ever happen there's a 70-foot ravine associated with this draw that would make it somewhat cost prohibitive especially in a suburban environment 
to develop a bridge to cross that 70 foot gap. I would never say never, but if you don't put it on the plan now, um, then somebody at some point in time, if they ever had the funds to do it and the wherewithal to try and get it done, they would have to come back to Planning Commission and City Council to get it put on the map and show that it was feasible. And then um, those folks would have an opportunity to protest it at that time. But it, with this proposal, they are not proposing to extend it across there. So with that, um, the Planning Commission recommended that the City Council approve the proposal and place the proposed collector onto the city's TSP functional classification map, and that was in line with the staff recommendation as well. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Just one quick question. Who owns, you know, the Anderson property is, who owns that piece on the other side that, that's all forested in where the bridge would have to go that you're talking about that's highly uh, unlikely? Part of it is federally owned, that's but the I'm Anderson thinking. property goes like this. Yeah, I know which one. It's, it's, a, it's a long piece. And then there are properties over here, and I'm not sure. I can't remember how they lay out. I might have it. Um, mm. Yeah, so you can kind of see the Anderson property as it goes up here. Um, in the aerial, I'm not sure if it's clear, but we have uh, BPA power lines right. and PGE power lines here which would also further limit the type of development that you would see in those properties. So achieving that 5,000 average daily trips is going to be way down the road. Um, the property that is owned right here um, that is between the Anderson property and the existing intersection uh, was owned by a gentleman up in Washington. I've heard, I'm not, it's not confirmed by anybody that he's uh, deceased now. And so that property might be in probate. Um, it wasn't clear from the county's records when I looked at them today whether or not it was in probate. So that property and that little triangle down at the intersection of Roy Rogers Road and Highway 99 are also privately owned. Did we have an applicant that wanted to come forward? I, I'm going to pull up theirs. Um, oh, here they are. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Middleton and councilors. Um, I'm Stephanie Sliman with Harper Hoff, Peterson Regellis, 205 Southeast Spokane Street, Suite 200. Portland, Oregon 97202. I'm the applicant's representative. With me tonight is Dan Erpenbach of Washington County, who is uh, the applicant. We also have our traffic engineer here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, very briefly, uh, thank you to staff uh, for the staff report initially that recommended approval of this TSP amendment. And as well, you heard the Planning Commission also recommended approval unanimously for this TSP amendment. Um, Backtracking back to July, we did meet with the neighbors within a thousand feet of the proposal and heard their input, which was incorporated into the proposal you see tonight. Um, so starting back in July, leading up to this point, we've been addressing those concerns and have the proposal before you. Um, very briefly, Dan is going to speak about the county's interest in amending the city's TSP map, and then we'll de defer the remainder of any time that you wish to give us uh, for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, councilors, for considering this proposal. As we all know, and as we have all dealt with, the intersection of 99W and Tualatin Sherwood Road, it's extremely congested. Keep that in mind. With this property up here in the corner, it's undeveloped property. It will develop. There's 50,000 people that go through that intersection every day. It's a very visible intersection. It will develop. In the past, the county and also the city, we've been kind of chasing traffic demands. It's We're trying to catch up with the demands, and now is an opportunity to kind of get ahead of the curve, put in a TS, and that's what this TSP amendment is doing, is putting on paper a plan that kind of will help development in this area. Washington County is approaching this corridor from four different 
perspectives, kind of a four-prong approach. One of the approaches widening to Alton Sherwood Road. Uh, another approach is an intelligent traffic system, an ITS system. Managing access is a third approach, and creating off-corridor circulation is a fourth approach. Now, there is no single solution for the congestion in this area. But combining these four different approaches will help reduce that congestion. This TSP amendment is looking at putting this road in to address managing access and creating off-corridor circulation. And that is it'll pull a lot of trips out of that intersection or off driveways or close to that intersection and get them more circulating internal to the property. With, um, again, with these four options, there's no single solution, but we're looking at a multiple of opportunities to try to help reduce the congestion. Any questions? Thank you. Well, I must explain that perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, on, this is on Ordinance 2014-004. Do we have any public comment on this one? This is the uh, Highway 99 and West Ordinance. It's, it's the first one, A. No, nothing? Oh, okay, you're the only one. Uh, Robert James Claus, 22211 Southwest Pacific Highway. I don't think we're talking about what the problem is here now. Walmart has the lowest income of any mass merchandiser and the lowest expenditure per trip, if you compare it to any other other than Kmart, which, thank God, are gone. What you're talking here is people that are going to draw from 15 miles and they're going to draw particularly in the holidays and the traffic season. Now, there's seven basic origin destination trips that you're supposed to learn when you go to traffic engineering. You're changing your origin destination trips. This is not developing around the to and from work trip you have now. This is creating an entirely different origin destination trip. I'm not really surprised as political as this county has become and as political as the system has become and as political as this council has become that you're not realizing it's not going to be long until you're using the orphan argument. I need Murphy, mercy because I shot my parents and I'm now an or orphan. You are changing the fundamental traffic here. As they say laughingly about Costco, you want to see a Walmart, just look at the oil in the parking lot. You don't have the same purchase. You have a much further trip in, and you change your profile. It's great that they come here and tell us now we need this to develop, but the fact of the matter is, because Walmart was put in illegally, i.e., you took PUD and then subdivided it, contrary to the code, which has been admitted, we now have a traffic problem. Now, I don't know what to say about it because the county does this sort of thing, i.e., politicians and the people who work for them always support other politicians and the people who work for them, and you would never, ever quite say the truth in Oregon. You'd choke on it. But you've created a problem that's going to expand here, and you're not talking about the agreement made with the 1,000 Friends of Oregon, which limit 
your linear access in, and you're not talking about what you're going to do to the neighborhood. My point is, this is pretty late in the day to begin to change the traffic patterns in this town because you made a decision in a back room, just the way you did with 100 apartments, that this was good for us. And there were certainly four of you up there that did that. And I find it amusing how the statistics don't lie. We just have transportation engineers, I guess. But you've changed the whole profile of that intersection. It's not you're even going to have the same origin destination trips and the same kind of consumers. And for somebody to sit here and say it's going to develop when it may be exactly opposite that, you're going to put other people out of business, is a little sad. I always laugh about the team. Dave Grant told me, you have retailing and there's more retailing. No, retailing is a zero-sum game. That's why John Elzo used to come here and kill service stations. Thank you, Jim. We have no more on ordinance 2014-004. I'm going to close this public hearing and bring it back to council. Oh, the, if the... Council comments? No, nobody wanted to. No? I'm just getting ready for the next one. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'll move or read caption and adopts ordinance 2014-004, approving an amendment to the transportation system plan and comprehensive plan regarding extension and designation of Southwest Langer Farms Parkway North of Highway 99 West and West. I'll second. Ordinance 2014-004, approving an amendment to the transportation system plan and comprehensive plan regarding extension and designation of Southwest Langer Farms Parkway north of Highway 99W and west. Councilor Clark? Aye. Councilor Langer? Aye. Councilor Butterfield? Aye. Councilor Folsom? Aye. Councilor Grant? Aye. Councilor President Henderson? Aye. Mayor Middleton? Aye. Thank you. We're going to take a five minute break now. We'll start at about 20 of them. Okay, we're calling it back to order, and you're on, Brad. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, so this was, um, with that, it was a separate application, but uh, was also heard at the December 10th, and this one was actually continued until the 28th to give the, app, um, the opponents some additional time to provide some information and discuss things with the county. This. Uh, proposal is a proposal to put um, extend Southwest Baylor Way which is right here north and ultimately there would be a local connection continuing north to tie up somewhere up here by Home Depot and then the collector would turn uh, and come back over to Langer Farms Parkway and then connect into um, a collector system that would run parallel to to Walton Sherwood Road in the future potentially uh, and Errol's Um, the properties are zoned generally uh, commercial and uh, light industrial with that planned unit development portion. This is, um, I believe, phase four of the Langer um, family planned unit development. And then here you see um, the intersection of Arrow and Olds Place, and Arrow would be the connection that would ultimately run parallel to and could tie in out at uh, Galbraith eventually. And uh, go on up to 124th or Cypole. Um, I, I'm not sure we've gotten that far, but I mean, it would 
seem that that would be the logical location because there was a partition, so it would be somewhere in that up by Galbraith that it would tie in. Um, so the county provided this application for the same reasons. They wanted to um, provide access to the properties. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion, and you'll hear some tonight about that signal being taken out. This would be one of the ways that um, access could be provided to that property. Um, alternative access uh, in addition to other types of access but I'll, that's not the point of this the point is is that we would do the collector here and it would go around the back of Sentinel storage and to the um, uh, local that could tie in eventually up to Langer Farms Parkway north which would provide access to these properties that are north so what you're looking at here um, in front of you is actually the Adams Avenue North concept plan which was considered by the city in around 2009. And at that time, the only reference to a road was uh, this dash here that called for a future collection point or connector point. And then obviously, as you know, Southwest Langer Farms Parkway doesn't go, it comes out and wraps around and comes out by um, uh, the Home Depot. So there is potential for those properties to develop out there. I think they're gonna have some of the same restrictions with those BPA no, power line sorry. easements and the PGE power line easements. Um, there's going to be some difficulty in what you would develop there. And obviously the PGE training facility is a very large facility and I wouldn't see that going away anytime soon. Um, again, the properties are all zoned light, industrial, and commercial. So it does make sense to serve them by a collector system. And uh, the proposed... Um, Roads are currently not shown on, this is the current functional classification map. They're not shown here, and the county is proposing to, again, um, show that those streets in that alignment, it wouldn't be uh, just the collector on the southern part and the uh, local uh, connecting further east. Um, in this area, the, their traffic engineers forecasted uh, traffic generation at 6,000 average daily trips, which is only a thousand more than what's on the other side that we just talked about. And you might ask yourself why, because uh, I asked that same question. But um, in talking with them, it, it's highly unlikely that you're going to see that a really super intense development there, again, because of the power line restrictions and everything that's going on in that area. Uh, the Planning Commission, again, followed staff's recommendation and recommends that the council hold the public hearing and place the proposed local collector street onto the city's transportation system plan for um, both access to those properties in and around and as a uh, safety precaution to provide some off, um, off to Walton Sherwood way uh, circulation. With that, if you have any other questions, I can be happy to answer them for you. Any questions? Matt? Um, I'm going to recuse myself from participating in this matter. The uh, proposed road extension could be designed or constructed adjacent to property that's uh, owned by my family. It could result in a pecuniary benefit to me or members of my family. And although this is only a potential conflict of interest and does not require that I recuse myself, I'm stepping down because I believe the public process should be completely free of any appearance of impropriety and will be better served if I do not participate. Can we have the applicant come forward then? We have no other questions. Thank you. The applicant has nothing further to add at this time other than to reiterate that this TSP amendment, as with the previous, is part of the county's four-pronged approach to helping to improve safety and capacity on Tualatin Sherwood Road. Thank you. Thank you. And you can come back in at the end if you want. Yes, thank you. Nate Schroeder? I know did, you didn't want to come up separately then, right? Okay. Dan Erpenbach, oh, you're gonna you're not coming up either. Okay. You might at the end. Phil Gorillo.
Good evening, Mayor Middleton and members of council staff. I'm Phil Grillo here on behalf of uh, Tactful Properties. So I'm going to be uh, brief in my comments uh, this evening. Um, I think you have a copy of the January 28th letters, plural, that I uh, submitted on behalf of Tactful at the Planning Commission level. Um, that's our position here this evening as well. Um, just in terms of um, basic updates, um, we have main, tried to maintain open communication with the county on this issue. It's our understanding still at this point that the county is really not willing to have uh, further discussions with us on this issue, so we're kind of at a standstill with them. Um, my sense is, is that they uh, are probably somewhat agreeable to the um, improvements that we're talking about to actually making the connection with Baylor, but that as far as I can tell, I don't believe that they are amenable to assisting us in any way with the um, connection to Highway 99. I want to compliment um, City Council and staff for their efforts in um, uh, encouraging ODOT to work with us to be able to get an access off of Highway 9, Highway 99. As you, I think, know, um, in early December, we had a meeting with them. That meeting was successful, and we had um, an oral understanding from uh, the planning director at ODOT at Region 1 that they would be willing to approve uh, write-in only access there. Um, now we're trying to uh, um, make uh, make that happen as part of this project. Um, I, I just want to point out that I think in this particular situation there is, I think, the notion that somehow this can just be decided later. The problem with that approach here is that when you're dealing with a TSP amendment to properties that are already developed and the project, in this case, Twalton and Sherwood Road, is significantly changing your existing access, there is generally no uh, new uh, land use process to go through to have a hearing on this issue. It's just going to go into a condemnation proceeding where it's just going to be a discussion between us and the county, and the county is going to decide what to do. So that's why it's important when you have a land use proceeding like this, uh, the TSP amendment, where land use issues and transportation issues come together, for you to have to flesh out these details a little bit more now. We're not trying to get to a design uh, element here. We're trying to get to a conceptual understanding of what should happen. And we think that we've uh, worked very hard to provide you with what we think are, is a reasonable condition of approval here. So I'm going to leave it at that. That's really what we're trying to accomplish here and why I think it's important um, for you to consider doing that at this stage. The only other thing I'll just mention is um, the Luba case is still pending. We were expecting a decision on the 12th. Uh, Luba has asked for a two-week continuance, so we expect a decision on the 26th. Um, uh, for what that's worth, that's the status of the, of the Luba case. Okay? If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Ty Wyman. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you so much for your time and attention this evening. My name is Ty Wyman, and I'm here as attorney tonight for MGP 10 Properties, LLC. That is MGP Roman 10. If you write, write it out, it looks like MGPX. It's MGP 10 Properties, LLC. So now I was here, I think, six or eight months ago uh, speaking to you on behalf of the same property, the Sherwood uh, Market Center, it was then owned by Regency Centers, which is a national real estate investment trust. Uh, MGP 10 is owned by Merlone Geyer Partners. Merlone Geyer Partners are based out of San Francisco. Uh, they are also a real estate investment trust, but they're, they're quite a bit smaller. They, as of September of last year, uh, had invested in uh, 62 retail centers, I should say in retail centers in 62 communities uh, along the West Coast. So what community would, would Merlone Geyer pick for its 63rd but Sherwood? And Sherwood really fits a profile for Merlone Geyer of, if I can say, a relatively high end, uh, you might say suburban community, although that's, I know we're not really supposed to say that word anymore. All the, the rest of those 62 are not necessarily in Money Magazine's top 10, but, but you get the picture. 
Uh, that is Merlone Geyer's profile. Uh, they have been, uh, they are, they are, they regret that they could not come tonight. It's only because of the short notice of this agenda item. They did attend the planning commission meeting a few weeks ago and testified. Uh, and they also attended a couple of weeks before that a private meeting uh, with, with Washington County staff. Um, uh, as a, uh, so I would, I would ask for you uh, to note then that uh, Merlone Geyer purchased this property, uh, which is uh, quite literally and figuratively at a crossroads, and they knew that, they knew that very well, but they wanted to make the investment um, uh, in this community, and they look forward to doing business with you on the council and with your staff for many years to come as to the highest and best use of the Sherwood Market Center, which is quite obviously very important property for the city as well as for Merlone Geyer. The substance of my comments would, not surprisingly, largely echo those of, of Mr. Grillo. Um, I, I stress to you that you are under no, you're under no time pressure. This is a legislative enactment. There's no 120-day rule. You've got this uh, Luba decision that hangs out there. You've got in your, what you're asked to approve, what you're asked to approve tonight, in terms of a plan amendment, is premised on the removal of a traffic signal. There are two material failings to that premise. First of which is the current challenge at Luba, which um, I think is very likely to re to return uh, the decision back to the county for at least more. Uh, for at least further consideration. So that the decision to remove the signal is by no means a foregone conclusion. Secondarily, and I think perhaps most importantly, is the signal shows in your existing TSP. So this would be a TSP amendment that's premised on, on removal of a signal that it still shows in, in the TSP. The Planning Commission was told, well, we, we think we may remove the signal when we go through our new TSP amendment process, which nicely we, we heard about earlier uh, this evening. Well, that's all well and good, but let's have that process first. Let's get the cart back behind the horse here. Uh, not asking you to make a decision, uh, a denial decision tonight, although we, certainly we'd, we'd love that, and I'm not going to kid you, but just well, why, are, why do we need to have this decision made right now when in eight days we're going to have the state's land use Board of Appeals uh, uh, inform all of us about the legality of that fundamental premise? With that, I'll stand down. I very much appreciate your attention and certainly will take any comments or questions. Thank you. No questions? Our clause. Robert James, Clause 22211 Southwest Pacific Highway. You know, every time I come to the council and see two councilmen show up at the Planning Commission, we know what the fix is in. And we know somebody's campaigning for mayor a little early. But anyway, to get to the point I'm making here is it's the procedural thing people are objecting to. Now, you have certain rules you don't enforce. You don't enforce subdivision rules unless you don't like the person. Then you enforce them. We found three cases where there's open violation of the rules. Now, the problem is that our golden people in our council and our attorneys make these decisions and then hand them to us. And what I want to thank you for is how easy you're making it to trace how you interpret the rules differently for certain individuals and how you ignore the rules where you need to give something to other individuals. What's going to be fun about this is we finally got a case where we believe a permit was issued completely illegally, similar to this, then you granted it. If you want something, it goes through this council quickly, no questions, and if someone you don't like want something, this thing would have been hung up for months. Now the reason I tell you that is what everybody's trying to tell you is there is a very difficult thing called procedural due process. It means that the rules apply equally. 
And I'm telling you, this is getting easier and easier to watch you create collector streets and then block them, then create them, then uncreate them, then lobby the, co the county to get money, and then to turn around and tell us when we come here and we complain that we can't get permits we're legally entitled to, that this kind of nonsense should simply be smiled about and okay. I would be very careful because like a coyote that has to have a double back set, you may be walking into a trap of your own making. You are continually <laughs> changing these rules based on the individual involved. Now this thing tonight is a classic case where there was political pressure put, the fix was in on the Planning Commission to pass it, it's going to pass tonight because you've made your mind up it's going to pass. I encourage you to continue this because if somebody has to litigate with you, which they're going to have to, that's inevitable. What you want to do is get your social affiliations and everything else lined up with people so we can look at them very carefully because there is absolutely no question in this town the rules do not apply to certain people. A PUD can be too old. A PUD can have be parceled. A PUD can be sold off in parcels. There can be backroom deals. People can deny something as a user, and that's their privilege. They don't have to tell us who it is. But misrepresentation of who that user is is a separate matter. And you've walked down this road until you think you've got enough money to do your community center. God help you as with your water line. Your water line's a disaster. The other stuff you've done has been a disaster. And for those of you that are banking your political future on this, I think you have. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. That's the last person I have to comment on that. Would you like to come up and do a rebuttal or? We'll be brief. Um, the uh, main contention of uh, Phil Grillo is that um, TACFEL would like to see a condition of approval that a conceptual design for uh, access off of Baylor be part of the TSP amendment. Um, we would argue that that is not relevant to a TSP amendment. This is, as was stated earlier by Brad Kilby, and during your TSP update, uh, amendment update process, this is a line on a map. Um, those decisions will happen later. And as you can see from the alignment, it's actually increasing opportunities for access for these properties. There's nothing about it that would preclude access in the future and at a time when it's appropriate to make those types of um, design decisions. Um, the second point uh, offered by Mr. Wyman is that um, he states that Baylor is uh, premised on the removal of the traffic signal that is part of the separate Tualatin Sherwood Road widening project. Um, as we stated at the Planning Commission hearing, we will state again unequivocally here, it is not premised on the removal of the signal. Regardless of what happens with that signal, the county is proposing this Baylor Way extension because it believes it helps promote better circulation and access off of uh, Tualatin Sh Sherwood Road. Um, so waiting for a LUBA decision to come out is not um, uh, an issue for making a decision on your part. I don't know if Dan, if you want to add anything. Here to answer questions. Thank you. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to council. Start at that end. Uh, he, you can, Brad. In case we have any questions, yeah. Councilor Butterfield. So, Brad. Yes, sir. Obviously, the planning commission approved this. Um, uh, you've heard them tonight. Um, I guess there were two fundamental questions that uh, were that we considered as staff in discussing this with the planning commission. Uh, one is is would this be a viable option, whether the the signal is removed or not? And you know the county has stated so, and we believe that it could provide access that it would be. Um, an alternative. There's no guarantee that in the future that you would get at that signal. 
here, it just signals to stay how you would get access back to these back properties by going through the cinema or around the cinema. You're still going to have to have some type of connection. So this offers connection to those properties. Um, the question is, is does it warrant a collector or um, local street? And I guess um, that really didn't come up. Uh, the other, uh, they, they made the case, the county made the case. Um, they had traffic numbers to support the case and um, making this a collector. And um, this side of uh, Twelfth and Sherwood Road for Baylor is a collector too. So it makes sense to continue the collector. Um, and then the other thing that was brought up was um, uh, access to these properties. And again, access is not something that's discussed in the transportation system plan, except for um, you might talk to access spacing requirements along collectors and arterials, um, which, you know, there can be issues here. And I would just add that in the future, I suppose that if this signal comes out and as part of their right-of-way discussions, there may be opportunities through major <laughs> modifications or minor modifications to those site plans to come in and have uh, consideration of this again. But at that time, we're going to be talking about access. And if they're losing any parking or landscaping, we're going to be looking at the dimensional and design standards of our code and how those properties can still satisfy those um, while being affected by that project. Councillor Folsom? I'm good. Councillor Grant, nothing? No, thank you. I actually have a question for Brad. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm cleared on the, the collector street. So um, when you're talking about the Adams Avenue being the second half of the collector street from the Langer Farms Parkway, uh, there's right there. Right here? Uh, no, no, Langer Farms Park, over. Over here. Okay, yeah. So go to um, Twelfth and Sherwood Highway. There, there is not a proposed light there. Is that correct? There is a, there is a light. There that's is being a light there. Okay. Constructed. So at at the new one that you're proposing here tonight, um, is there a proposed light there as well? There's an existing light there. Okay, right, because that's uh, that's the one by Le Schwab. Okay, okay, all right. And what's the distance between those two collector or the proposed collector and the to be created collector? I, I don't know the exact distance. I would say there's between five and six hundred feet. Any more questions? House President Henderson. Um, <clears throat> so we've had a number of, of residents and business owners come and talk to us about this uh, road widening project and potential removal of the light. So I'm trying to understand, and I appreciate that those are not inclusive. Um, one of the concerns that people had is we have a somewhere in our packet on page 158 is um, the potential to have a write-in only off of 99, correct? Yes, ma'am, right at the back uh, of back the cinema. Yeah, right there. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So <clears throat> the blue dotted line, which um, Councillor Clark was just asking about, how does that serve the existing development to the west of Les Schwab, or does it? It to to this direction, mm -hmm. correct. It does uh, through. There's actually my understanding are there is an easement here. Yeah. But um, I'm not sure if it's a private discussion that they've had where that actually comes back here. And now they actually have an easement across this back property here, and they pay this gentleman an annual um, amount of money for having access across here. Clearly, with the number of people that you have in these in these places, uh, there's a need for um, at least two accesses. Mm -hmm. And currently, that's how they're proposing that. Um, if they close this access down to vehicular or leave it right in, right out, you still have an access here. You could potentially have a full access here. And you could, at a cost of $700,000, which is very expensive, put an access back here. Um, and then ultimately, once this street comes in, you could have a, a, an even... Uh, different access. Right. Um, so there are options for access, different types of options mm -hmm. of access, and we'll be looking at that. Any type 
of negotiation that goes along with this street widening, we'll, one of those that'll be one of the uh, considerations that we have with the fire district and ourselves is how is that site being adequately served for fire life and safety? Mm -hmm. So the gentleman who, the company who owns that lot that's currently under lease, will that street be planned to be put through? For example, can somebody go? Right here? Yes, exactly. So if they're coming down from Tiger, do they want to come to theaters, theaters or Les Schwab? Instead of going all the way down here and then coming all the way up here and then turning, and potentially, will this go through? It's speculative on my part to say that it would. It hasn't been discussed to my knowledge. Bob might. Because the irony is that this road will will join up Langer Farms north, but there's not anything here. But there's a lot over here, so that's why I'm asking that question. And maybe it's pre maybe it's premature, but I'm trying to understand. Um, this was a really important um, addition to the project for. I think for traffic flow and for those people who earn, you know, their living in that existing development. So I'm trying to understand, you know, how is that part of the solution if the signal's removed? Um, what I would say is that Thanks, Bob. for the transport, strictly for the transportation system plan, it provides connectivity not only for the Bailiway extension mm -hmm. uh, coming off and going through the Bailiway, uh, but also sets up the east-west connection with Arrow Street, which is also part of our uh, TSP plan, <coughs> current plan, for, you know, sort of the north bypass part of that whole system that right. was supposed to be there. We understand that the extension of that roadway is necessary and part of the roadway improvement project because it will provide the offsetting um, impacts to the removal of the signal. The, the concept of not providing that as part of the plan, it, it, it's really not there. We see it as a necessary component of the future design of the roadway improvement project. So I hope that answers some of the question about whether or not it's going to be built. It probably will need to be Good as question. part of a mitigation for the removal of the signal. I don't necessarily disagree with that. I think that was always part of our... The access off of there, the, the roadway is probably going to be built into the site so that access to the site, including the cinema portion of it, will be, will, will, will be uh, mitigated for the removal of the light. I think the part that won't need to be built will be from that point west towards um, Langer Farms Partway. Uh, Parkway at this time, east. East, east. I'm sorry, uh, towards Langer Farms Parkway yeah. at this time. I think that development, as it occurs, and it will because it will have access back there, will develop that access um, point and uh, extend the road out to Langer Farms Parkway. Thereby, we'll get that road in there as development occurs beyond what it is right now. What we're trying to do is mitigate for any of the the removal of the signal at this point in time as part of this whole issue. So um, there's, there's two aspects of this whole thing. I would say that if you're looking at strictly for the requirements of a TSP amendment, does this requirement that they're showing right now, looking at the overall system um, uh, uh, use, how it operates in the future, that this does meet the criteria for acceptance of the TSP amendment. The other items are specific to the design of the roadway. They aren't to be negated as part of this process. They're kept in the back of your memory or your minds, but we will make them a part of the roadway design improvement mitigation process. That's, that's part of what we already know that we want put in place. And, and just to clarify, um, they're, they're two, I mean, they really are, and it's hard because they're very interwoven, but they're two separate issues. There's the TSP amendment that allows, um, you know, that identifies the road. It helps facilitate discussions um, about mitigation, but it is not, it's not 
it is not the mitigation. It's not identifying the mitigation. As the county um, mentioned, it's, it's, tr it's the four-prong trying to solve um, the, the issues with congestion on Tualatin and Sherwood via many different avenues. So having the line on a map enables us to get a step further down the road, um, no pun intended, um, mm -hmm. to actually build something. But we'll, we'll figure out exactly what can and should be built as part of that um, Tualatin and Sherwood Road Improvement Project as the county moves forward in that decision. Okay. Thank you both, or all three of you. I move we read, caption, and adopt Ordinance 2014-005. Second. Ordinance 2014-005, approving an amendment to the Transportation System Plan and Comprehensive Plan regarding extension and designation of Southwest Baylor Way north of 12 to Sherwood Road. Councilor Clark? Aye. Councilor Langer has recused himself. Councilor Butterfield? Aye. Uh, Councilor Folsom? Aye. Councilor Graham? Aye. President Henderson. Aye. Mayor Middleton. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, staff. We have one citizen comment. Steve. Can't re I can't read your last name very well. Live on Stellar. Is he <laughs> Huffinger? Yeah. Come on up. Dog park. So we've moved on to citizen comments. Citizen okay. comments, etc. My name is Steve Holthouse. I live at 167 Stellar Drive. And I'm here to ask the council what they can tell me about the possibility of a dog park in the city of Sherwood. Well, I might have well, Who's the liaison open it park board? Bill. Bill. <laughs> Bill is. I went to the Parks and Recreation Board meeting. Well, let me kind of segue into from Parks Board into City Council. Sure. The reason that you're here is because obviously you didn't think you got the answer you wanted or enough of an answer. And so what we have proposed is next month uh, the mayor is coming to Parks and Rec. He's got some ideas. He's got some people that have some ideas. I think at that meeting, I stressed that we we're always looking for opportunities, ways to pay for it, ways to design it, possibly people that can get involved and help get this thing up and running. So I think coming to city council is a great thing. Um, we've all talked about it, not collectively, but uh, we're on board to try to find and resolve the dog park issue. Uh, Linda's had a couple of ideas. We got a couple of people from the parks board that have ideas. And so when we get back together at our next meeting, March 3rd, March 3rd, 3rd. we're, we're going to have a, a pretty good discussion about that. All right. Uh, is it possible to appoint a dog park committee? Would that be the city council's responsibility or the parks and recreation? We could talk about it at the parks and then at that time we may have enough people as a group that we could just form a, a committee they don't have to be official but it could be kind of an offshoot he's our rep with parks so pretty much everything we do goes through him but uh, i've got a list of about i think there's about 10 or 11 people that want to come to it i think nancy's going to come if she can and so at that point we'll get more involved and talk it out a little more there's been some issues coming back and forth but we want to kind of Maybe see if we can zero in on some locations and then get from it from there. So, I see three locations right now that are, you know, dog parks unofficial. <laughs> I know. Woodhaven Wood Park and uh, uh, Stellar Park, or excuse me, Stella Olson Park, and the church at the old, uh, at the old hall for St. Francis, that mm -hmm. big open field, that's very well used. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
yeah, bring those ideas back because we're gonna. That's the night we're gonna all get together and kind of hash it out and talk about it. And I didn't know that location, so I, we may have some. Well, oh, I, I would not that's private property. property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but it can be used. You can use uh, property that if you have permission, but you don't want to put a lot of money into anything private because they have other designs for that. So, and there's a few more ideas and. We're going to try and develop maybe a list and, and get working on it. And I've got support from Public Works. We've been talking to them, the city manager. So it's something we're, we're going to really work on. No, I'm on your email. Yeah, you, yeah, I think I just sent something. So, And I'm going to send out a reminder so we can get as many as – what time does the meeting start, Bill? Seven? Seven. Yeah, so as many people as we can get there. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Back to the front here. Council announcements. Council announcement. You want to come up again? Come on up, four minutes. Robert James Claus, two 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 one one Southwest Pacific Highway. Once you look at your form. Okay, now I want to go down this form because what I'm contending is simple. And you and your legal counsel are conspiring to violate 14 and the related provisions in the First Amendment. You start off with the fact no individual may impugn the character of anyone. I think Will Wadge has summed that up better than anyone that you can't insult a politician, nobody can say anything that low, so you can't commit libel and slander. Uh, but apparently, we can't talk about the character of anyone, but I thought. Court just said that's what the public hearing is about. Now let me go on because it gets better. Anytime anybody complains, you can throw them out based on content. I thought there was some provision about time, place, and manner content. But now we know there is an insurance. We know you don't have to process what exact time of meeting, the political support, do those things now. But here's the one that's really human. Comment time is four minutes with council option, one minute question and answer. So if the council has a question for one minute, you can't answer it. Okay, so the lawyer to figure that one out, <laughs> or somebody could be a lawyer. Oh, wait a minute, can't get into character. I don't want to mention lawyers, but I have two sons of lawyers, what am I saying? Then you have language, extraordinary dialogue. Oh my, I didn't know you people that well educated, but I can tell you why. You may submit in mail, not you shall. It gets a little better than that. You can preclude comments that you don't want in the meetings, but they can only be four minute limit. Now, does that include both written and comments? I call that sloppy grammar, but again, that's insulting so that the character of the motion we can't write the English language. Any person who prevails with the reasonable rules of conflict causes interpreted may be required to leave or fail to be a trespasser. Good luck. Good luck. We know stealing signs is okay. We know raiding buildings is okay. But being speaking your mind is not. What is Claymwood to bring in the meeting right now? I've never heard anything like this. Abrams went to prison for character assassination of Woodrow Wilson by saying it was a bad idea to send people there to hold the country. And a number of years later, the Supreme Court has said, that's nonsense. But it's not in Sherwood. Gee, Brandis, what happened to him? Or Holmes? Yeah, I guess it even writes a lawsuit. 
this is just more of what you people are doing all of the time. And I don't mind. Because it makes your depositions easier, it makes the interrogatories easier, it makes a lot of things easier. But you might spend some time thinking about what you're doing. Because maybe city county will try to do it. But if you happen to have business interest in this town, I don't think you can afford to recover. Now, I just Mark roused the council and said he thought he agreed with me. So I'd be very careful in this need to suppress information and hand out political favors, assuming that's all they are, which I have great doubts that's all they are. Thank you. Thank you. Council comments, and we got four minutes. And that's going to include the city manager comments. I have a quick um, Mayor, I, we had our Cultural Arts Commission meeting last night with all nine of our commission members. They asked me to bring back to council um, a question. Um, and I'm so sorry because I had to drop a couple of the kids off on my way. I forgot the um, their mission that was um, drawn up when they were formed by resolution in 2001. I had right. copies for everyone. So I'll try to have that um, for you the next time. Or perhaps is it okay, Sylvia, if we email that to all of the counselors? Yeah, that would probably be the most efficient way to do it. But what they need to know is how you would like them to, um, uh, specifically with uh, the Cultural Arts Commission, what process do you see for them to help participate? Do we want to have a conversation about, you know, how they can help support that facility? And it sounds to me like it might be a time... Um, that we get with staff and we get with council right. and determine what that future looks like and how they can help. They have their existing projects and their programming um, already in place. They're still planning to go ahead and do the uh, two sessions of Missoula Children's Theater in partnership with the SFA this year. They will also continue to do the picks on the plaza as a programming wing. Um, we also hope to have a forum for the community uh, so that we can talk about the with the stakeholder groups in the community, not just about the cultural center, but about networking for the continued use of an arts calendar that we produced last year from the Cultural Arts Commission. So um, probably I'm thinking, you know, May, June-ish, it might be a nice time to have a work session. But if council can give some thought and direction to where we need this group to serve in with, re with reference to the cultural um, center and they have some we need they asked us to think as a URA board as well um, to wear that other hat about how we're going to start referring to that facility and and what we're going to call it so those are the two things they asked me to bring back the senior center we haven't had a meeting since the last time we were here so I'm done okay I already covered parts of right so I'll pass it on down In a couple. <clears throat> uh, Mathnasium's now open. They had a chamber mixer there this morning. If nobody's been there yet, it's a pretty neat, fun, and lively, exciting math place to visit. The YMCA Dine and Dash is coming up the first week in uh, March. So um, take a look at the website and get that in your calendar. And uh, the Chamber Annual Awards Dinner. It's coming a little bit early this year. It's in mid-June, and up on their websites already are the uh, nominations for the annual awards. Thank you. Do you have anything? Um, Sylvia, we, um, um, I'm serving as a liaison on the Charter Review Committee, and we recently discovered that there's an internal date the state is applying to when we have to file a ballot by May. So we will be sending something out. Um, we were scheduled to have a work session on the 27th, but I believe we're going to move that to the 25th. Is that correct? Tuesday the 25th. And the reason why we're, we're able to do that is the Planning Commission is not meeting that night. And, um, but we have to file by the 28th of February to make the May election. I, I'm sorry, we don't have to file. There's a state law that requires us to give it to Sylvia. I'm not really sure how that's helping in the process, but um, we only just discovered it in this year's manual, 
and we have to approve the explanatory statement and get them to her, and then she has a little bit more time to forward them on to the county. And if you want to comment, Sylvia, we just found that out, so we need to adjust our schedule for next week a little bit. So as Councillor Anderson um, stated, I'll go ahead and put that email out for a proposed meeting on Tuesday the 25th. Um, I also have to get the Charter Review Committee to see if they're available for that meeting as well. But the plan is that there is a date of February the 28th that the City Council must adopt a ballot title and submit that to the elections official that would be me by 5 p.m. on February 28th. So it's the filing of that ballot title that you have to come to some conclusion on. So we have to adopt it. Correct. You have to adopt in session. that in session. So the thought is right now is to have a um, joint session on Tuesday the 25th with the council and the um, Charter Review Committee to review their work, um, their ballot titles, their um, uh, proposed sure. changes to the charter. And then upon that, hopefully that evening, if the council comes to some conclusion, the council um, will then either open that, that evening a regular session hold a public hearing that, that evening, and adopt those four proposed four, amendments. Yeah. Um, if the worst case scenario, the council is not comfortable and is not ready to adopt on the evening of the 25th, if anything is going to get on the May ballot, a decision has to be made by 5 p.m. on the 28th. February? Yep. So that's You're going to be running from, that meeting because I'll be coming. It's, it's okay. next week. Yeah, I'll be yeah. coming. Good okay. planning. I'm that's gone. It. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, the one thing I had is from Planning Commission, we'll be bringing back to the council on front yard setbacks, and that'll be coming up. So. All right. Okay. City Manager. Actually, uh, Council President Anderson covered the topic that I was going to bring up, oh, which is the charter. So we've already taken care of that. I don't have anything else to report unless you have questions for me uh, or any of my uh, senior leadership team. Is everybody okay with the 25th? Because that will be a Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. I think we'll do a six. Okay. Okay. Is that it? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. He started at seven oh one.